What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're going to check out 10 WWE World Title reigns that should have lasted longer by none other than Cultaholic Wrestling. I've been subscribed to them for a few years now, so uh, from time to time, I do check out their videos, but this will be the first time I believe I will be checking out their videos on my channel doing a reaction for you guys. So, uh, yeah, this should be interesting. I can easily think of one right now. Bray Wyatt's wwe uh title reign should have been much longer than what it was that's that's just one i can think of offhand so this should be an interesting video man so uh let's get right into this appreciate all the love and support road to 60k man and uh let's do this The WWE title, arguably the biggest prize in professional wrestling. The one belt the majority of wrestlers aspire to one day hold. This and the big goldie too. Let's not forget WWE's other classic world championship. Mm -hmm. Between the pair of them, there have been over 190 reigns. We've seen the good, the bad, and the far too brief. And yes. that is what we are looking at today. Those title wins that unleashed a wave of euphoria and optimism throughout the WWE fan base, then were over in the blink of an eye, usually as the status quo was restored. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE Championship reigns that should have lasted longer. Join us. Number 10, Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt is one of the I most- I said it, I said it, I said it before the video even started. Bray Wyatt should have had a longer title run, and it was cut short by Randy Orton at WrestleMania. It just, it's like they have something good, they have something great, and WWE will find a way to not capitalize on it. They do it every time, every single time outlandish characters in recent memory, with a strong aura and presence about him. But he is one performer who has suffered more than any other thanks to poor booking and creative. In early 2017, the Eater of Worlds was on a tear, making the final three of the Royal Rumble, then bagging a place in the WWE title elimination chamber match. On the night, Bray overcame the likes of AJ Styles, John Cena, and Dean Ambrose to win the belt, yep. setting up a WrestleMania showdown with Rumble winner and Wyatt family brother Randy Orton. The two Two met at Mania in a major misfire of a match, more remembered for Kevin Dunn's spooky bollocks insect projections than any in-ring action. Making things even worse, Orton unnecessarily beat Wyatt to win his umpteenth world title, ending the reign at a week 49 days. Still, I suppose it could have been worse. He could have lost in three minutes to Goldberg in Saudi Arabia. Oh Number man, bro. It just doesn't make sense to me. I will never understand WWE's mindset when it came to booking Bray Wyatt. I will they would do something that the fans always wanted and then literally they'll take it away. Fans wanted him as WWE champion. He finally becomes WWE champion only to lose it to Randy Orton at WrestleMania. Why not give him a nice WrestleMania win? That would have been a nice little WrestleMania win that People could have really started buying into Bray Wyatt even more. Like, oh my Jesus, bro. Number nine, Jeff Hardy. Mm, Jeff Hardy has always is, been super a popular one with a dedicated fan base, but that fan base really started to make themselves heard when the charismatic Enigma returned to WWE in 2006. After runs in the intercontinental and tag title scenes, the company's decision makers could hardly ignore the thunderous crowd reactions he yep. received or the mountain of merchandise he shifted as Jeff beat Triple H at Armageddon 2007 yes. to become the number one contender to Randy Orton's WWE title. Orton would retain the title at Royal Rumble 2008 but Jeff would again challenge for the gold, this time coming up short against Triple H in a pair of thrillers at No Mercy and Cyber mm -hmm. Sunday 2008. Eventually, Jeff came up trumps, beating Edge and Hunter at Armageddon, capping off a year plus of trying to win the big one. It was a joyous scene, but just for... A fantastic moment. Uh, I believe JR ended up calling uh, one, the match that he actually did win. Like, it was just dope to see like Jeff Hardy finally getting the wwe championship it was so it was a it was a momentous occasion for sure 22 days later at the royal rumble jeff fell in his first major defense losing to edge in a no dq match when brother matt turned yep. on him the bastard number eight 
Yeah, I okay, remember that they were going with the uh, brother versus brother feud at the time, and Matt came out there and screwed him over. Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan had already Easy. shown that he could hold Easy. the main title during his 2011 to 2012 World Heavyweight title run. But after his popularity exploded in 2013 due to his work in Team Hell No, the fans chose Bryan as their guy. Yep. John Cena agreed, handpicking Bryan as his opponent at SummerSlam 2013, with the GOAT beating Cena clean in the main event. Unfortunately, though, special guest ref Triple H helped Randy Orton cash in money in the bank, with Bryan's reign over in minutes. Bryan would eventually beat Orton at Night of Champions to win the title back, but only for a day due to a controversial finish. Yep. Although Bryan was eased out of the title picture in favor of Cena, Orton, and Big Show, the super vocal Yes movement ensured that Bryan made it to the main event of WrestleMania 30, winning the unified titles on the grandest stage. Beautiful. Sadly, though, what could have been an epic reign was cut short due to injuries, ending yeah. it at 65 days. Thankfully, he would have a more substantial run four years later. Mm -hmm. Number seven, Edge. Propelled by the real-life love triangle with Matt Hardy and Lita, Edge became the sleazy, must-watch, rated R yeah. superstar and upped his game in every respect. WWE, realizing his potential, booked Edge to win the first ever Money in the Bank ladder match. Which he didn't uh, even want to participate in that. Edge, I, uh, uh, I want to say, I don't know if it was recent, but he had came out saying... Uh, in an interview um, that he didn't initially want to be in that match. He had to be like kind of, I guess you can say, convinced to be in that match. And it's crazy because him being in that match changed his career forever. If someone hadn't convinced him to be in that match, you, you know, we may not have the edge we have today. We may not have the multiple championships like we have today. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, kudos to that person that did convince him to just go ahead and be in a match because it catapulted his career. For sure, no doubt about it. WrestleMania 21. Edge carried the briefcase around everywhere, but since he was the first person to hold it, there was no expectation or clue as to when he would cash it in. When he did so on John Cena at New mm -hmm. Year's Revolution, it was instantly iconic and solidified Edge as a true main eventer. In the following weeks, Edge demonstrated that he could be a ratings draw too, as fans tuned into Raw in their droves to see what slash who he was doing. Who -er. It was exciting, different, and three weeks later, it was over, as Cena regained the title yeah. at the Royal Rumble. In fact, most of Edge's WWE title reigns were of a transitional nature, with the longest of the four clocking in at just 76 days. Number 6. Big Show 2002 started kind of quiet for the Big Show, but his fortunes changed when he was drafted to SmackDown in October, making an instant impact by attacking yep. and kayfabe injuring The Undertaker, then becoming number one contender to Brock Lesnar's WWE title. The next big thing hadn't had the belt for too long at that point and was in the midst of an impressive undefeated streak, so the odds of show unseating him weren't great. However, Brock was working with several niggling injuries, and WWE gave show the win at Survivor Series, turning Lesnar babyface and I know for a fact Dub would be loving this segment right now. He would be relishing in the fact that Brock, a, long, a young Brock Lesnar, <laughs> lost to the big show at this time. I know Dub is. He would love this segment of this video, for sure. Paul Heyman heel in the process. A rejuvenated Big Show running rubshot mm -hmm. over the blue brand with Heyman could have been great, but 28 days later, he lost the belt to Kurt Angle at Armageddon. Nothing was going to stop Angle versus Lesnar happening yeah. at WrestleMania, and Show was always going to be a way to get the title to Kurt so that Brock could chase. Yeah. But it was a shame for Paul White. Number five, Rob Van Dam. Yes, you got to put RVD in there, man. I wish his title reign was a little bit longer. It should have been longer, bro. Oh, man, got to put him in. Got to put him in the mix. By being immensely over and mixing it up with top stars like Steve Austin and The Rock in main events, WWE were hesitant to book Rob Van Dam above a certain level after his debut in The Invasion, with Mr. Monday Night settling into the mid-card. After recovering from a severe knee injury in 2005, Van Dam returned with a renewed fire, winning the second ever Money in the Bank ladder mm -hmm. match at WrestleMania 21 before cashing in against John Cena at ECW One Night Stand 2. 
His first world title was worth the wait, and on the first episode of ECW on Sci-Fi, Paul Heyman gave RVD the ECW world title too, making him a double champ. Mm -hmm. Mere weeks later though, Van Dam and partner Sabu were arrested on possession charges. WWE suspended the champ for 30 days and booked him to drop both titles on the subsequent Raw and ECW oh, wow. shows. After years of being overlooked, it's unfortunate RVD's sole WWE title run went up in smoke. Wow. I never knew that. I, that actually, I never knew why he had to drop, like, drop the title so quickly. Now it makes sense because of that situation. Damn, man. That sucks. Because they could have legitimately gave him a nice title run because he was over. Damn, man. Number four, The Undertaker. Despite being one of WWE's longest mainstays and beloved mm -hmm. characters, The Undertaker didn't hold the top prize all too often or for too long. Of course, the argument could be made that the dead man didn't need to be WWE or World Heavyweight Champion since his gimmick was so strong and so over, and that his general lack of beatability made it hard to book him as effectively if he held the belt. This makes sense, because The Undertaker was one of those characters that honestly... He didn't need the belt. He actually legitimately didn't need the belt because he was automatically going to be over. And booking him to have the title, the only way you could really have him legitimately lose and it kind of keeps his character strong is if there's like some outside interference because the way they've always booked the Undertaker is like he's not just a normal man. He's like more than just you know, what you and you and, you know, you and I are, you know what I'm saying? Like he, he's supernatural esque and that's how they've always booked him. He can take just ridiculous amount of punishment and keep going. That's how they booked him. So I get why he didn't really need the belt to still be one of the staples in like wrestling altogether. In the same way, they really should have booked, um, Bray Wyatt's fiend gimmick. They should have booked it like that because him chasing for the title, I know this is a little tangent, but him chasing for the title against Seth Rollins, it wasn't going to really work in a sense because of how he's booked. He's this supernatural character that damn near doesn't sail for any major finisher. He can just take punishment over and over and over. So when he was going for the title so quickly, it kind of, you had to throw the belt on him. And when they didn't throw the belt on him initially, that's when fans backlash. And with characters that have these supernatural abilities and powers in wrestling, it's hard to put a title on them because the only way they can legitimately lose is if someone cheats, someone screws them over. So at least that's, you don't want them to lose clean because then be like, what's the point of having these superpowers if you're just going to lose clean or have this greater, you know, than I'm not a human being type persona when you lose clean to someone, you know what I'm saying? So I get that. Of all of his short reigns, his world heavyweight title run in 2007 was the most disappointingly brief. He beat Batista in a blockbuster at WrestleMania yep. 23, having won the Royal Rumble match for the privilege. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, Taker was lean, mean, and putting on the matches of his life. Regrettably, he soon went down with a torn bicep, necessitating surgery. That meant his reign would have to be cut short, so WWE engineered a scenario where Edge would cash in his Money in the Bank mm -hmm. briefcase, with the Phenom dropping the strap after a short 37-day reign. Number 3, Shawn Michaels. Similar to the case of Big Show we looked at earlier, Shawn oh, Michaels yeah. won a world title at the 2002... Yeah, man. That, ah. Uh, ah, oh, man. That elimin... I believe that was at Elimination Chamber. That I think that was, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was the first ever Elimination Chamber, and he won the title. And his title reign was not that long. I, I wish they would have... Let him have to strap for a little bit, you know, a, a longer time than they did, though. Viva series, only to lose it the next month at Armageddon. Mm -hmm. For HBK, though, his title win was even more special as it he was won great. it in the first ever Elimination Chamber awesome. match at Madison Square Garden yep. in only his second bout back after him yep. probably returning from a four year injury layoff. WWE gave Michaels the World Heavyweight title in a confetti filled feel good One of the greatest like feelings to a pay-per-view ending to a pay-per-view I had seen at that time 
JR commentary was it gives me goosebumps just thinking about it, bro. The confetti falling. It was a beautiful moment. And I thought they were gonna really have him hold the title for a while. And it was even greater because of the story they were telling between HBK and Triple H. Because the match he had prior to was against Triple H. And he beat him. And then Triple H tried to storyline wise in you know in his career. So when you have this happen and you have him beat Triple H, like actually pin Triple H for the one, two, three here. And he takes, because I think Triple H at this time was going in as a champion. Uh, he takes the title. He wins it. Like it was just a such a good feel, a feel good moment. And I just, I really wish WWE would have literally like kept this momentum going for Shawn Michaels moment. However, it soon became apparent that Michaels was not yet back long term and that the title reign was tokenistic in nature. Oh. HBK defended the title one time, a disqualification loss to Rob Van Dam on Raw, before giving it back to Triple H at Armageddon after losing a three stages of hell match. Mm -hmm. A four week reign with the big gold belt would have been fine had the showstopper captured another one before his 2010 retirement, but he didn't and this mm -hmm. felt like a missed opportunity. Number two, Christian. Since oh, returning to WWE yeah. in 2009, Christian's run with the ECW title seemed to be his ceiling until lifelong friend and tag partner Edge was forced to retire whilst World Heavyweight Champion. Mm -hmm. In a bid to move out of Edge's shadow whilst also paying tribute to him, Christian beat Alberto Del Rio in a ladder match at Extreme Rules 2011 to win the gold. The title win had been a long time coming yeah, for Captain Charisma, it, it, who was a great definitely... worker, popular... It was definitely something beautiful to see at the time, man, because, you know, we Christian had been around since Edge had been around. So it was just so good to see that, see him capture the gold. And a fresh face at the top of the card. But then on the very next episode of SmackDown, he dropped it to Randy Orton, you know, the proper star. Luckily, he won it back a couple of months later at Money in the Bank with Christian and Orton having a tremendous summer series that elevated not just them, Oh no, that those series of matches between Christian and Randy were fantastic. He even started having uh the roles started switching because Christian started turning heel and Randy started turning face because Christian was his gimmick at that point was one more match. That was his gimmick. That was, you know, that was his gimmick at that point. It was gonna be just I just need one more match. Like it was it was they were having fantastic matches, man but the title itself. Christian proved that he could carry the championship and deliver the goods, but he mm -hmm. didn't get long to enjoy it, dropping it back to the Viper 28 days later in another belter at SummerSlam. Yep. Number one, Mankind. Mm. 1999 was particularly bad for playing hot potato with the WWE title as it flipped back and forth between the likes of Steve Austin, The Rock, The yep. Undertaker, and Triple H. Yep. Mankind got in on the act too, lifting the big one on the January 4th episode of Raw in a win that put a lot of butts in seats. Yep. 20 days later and The Rock was champion again for a week when Mankind got the belt back once again, winning the rating smash halftime heat empty arena bout that yep. aired during the half time of the Super Bowl. And that lasted for two weeks when The Rock once again regained it in a ladder match on Raw. There was simply no chance WWE weren't going to go with The Rock versus Austin for the title of mm -hmm. WrestleMania, but it was harsh on the hardworking Foley. Mankind's third and final WWE title run that year lasted just 24 hours, winning the strap in a triple threat match at SummerSlam, only to drop it to Triple H the next night on Raw. Yeah, man. This is this is one of those things where, you know, mankind was, you know, he was in an era where they had The Rock, they had Stone Cold, they had Triple H, they had The Undertaker. Like, those guys in themselves, Kurt Angle, like, those guys in themselves were mega over. So, and granted, mankind was, you know, the ultimate underdog at that time. And it was one of those things where, you know, he was over as well. But when it came to Stone Cold and The Rock, they were at the top of the car. Like, 1A, 1B. Some people prefer The Rock over Stone Cold. Some people prefer Stone Cold over The Rock. They were both at the top. So, a lot of people wanted to see the titles on them, to be honest with you. Not to say people didn't love seeing the titles on Mick Foley. But it's just one of those type of things where them being in that time period, 
Like a lot of people were on the A game, on the A game, and a lot of people were trying to get to the spot where the Rock and Stone Cold was at. So, but this was a dope video, man. Very interesting. I found out some things I didn't know, like the RVD situation. Did not know that. So, comment down below. Let me know any other WWE champions or World Heavyweight champions that you feel like they should have had a longer title reign. Let me know down below. I would like to get your thoughts and opinions on that. But I appreciate all the love and support. Road to 50K. Appreciate y'all kicking it with me. And I'll see y'all on the next one. Peace.